In this presentation, we will discuss materiality determination, or in other words, how to determine materiality. As we go through this, note that we're still really in the planning of the audit stage. And when we break out the audit, we broke out the audit into stages we're thinking about. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it about this in the stages we had the client acceptance or continuance we had the preliminary engagement activities we got the planning of the audit then we consider and audit internal controls then we go through those audit business process and related accounts those substantive tests then we complete the audit and finally evaluate results and issue the audit report important to keep that in mind we're typically here we're focusing here mainly when we're thinking about the evaluation of materiality at the beginning of the audit so as we go through the audit, we have an idea of what those materiality levels will be, allowing us to better plan the audit and then execute that plan through the audit process. So then first, what is materiality? Once again, this is going to be uh, materiality as defined by the United States Supreme Court interpretation. A fact is material if there is a substantial likelihood that the fact would have been viewed by a reasonable investor as having significantly altered the total mix of information made available. So let's go through that a little bit again. We're going to go through this again. We got a fact is material if there is a substantial likelihood. So again, that word substantial likelihood is going to be a key term because it adds some ambiguity. What does that exactly mean? We don't know exactly, but we can get some kind of idea with that wording that the fact would have been viewed by a reasonable investor. So similar to that term we always hear in the law, reasonable person, reasonable investor, common sense type information is kind of what we would think our mind goes towards uh, with that. But again, some ambiguity in terms of what exactly materiality means in terms of a quanti quantifiable number as having significantly altered the total mix of information. And I would interpret that to mean that this misstatement that we're looking at, this misstatement that we're thinking about would tell us or have us alter the total mix. In other words, in our case, usually the total financial statements or our uh, opinion of those total financial statements due to the problem that is there, typically a problem being an error or something that is omitted. So how do we apply then materiality to an audit? First of all, we're going to determine the overall materiality. And this is typically going to happen within the planning stage, the overall type of materiality. So we want to think about materiality as a whole, as a total on the total financial statements. Then we're going to think about the determine the tolerable misstatement. As we think about tolerable misstatement, note what we're doing here. We're saying this is the materiality level. When we consider the materiality level, we are thinking about then conversely that the level of misstatement then that would be tolerable we're actually thinking about how much misstatement would be okay or under the threshold of a material misstatement which would not be okay so once we have uh, the materiality level we could determine tolerable misstatements as we do so we're looking at the allocation of material uh, materiality at individual account and class transaction level so now we're thinking about materiality not at the overall level not at the financial statements as a whole but at the individual accounts and the transaction levels that's going to give us a more defined kind of a system that we can apply to actual audit processes because when we audit the financial statements we will be breaking that into the individual account and transaction level then we can evaluate the audit uh, the auditing findings and that happens near the end of the audit process so we're going to say, hey, what's the overall maturity level, materiality level? Then we're going to determine the tolerable misstatements. And we're going to do that on the individual account type levels. We're going to go through uh, the, the audit. Then we're going to evaluate. We're going to take this tolerable misstatement levels and take the results of our audit, evaluate the audit findings. That's going to happen towards the end of the audit where we're going to take what we found within the audit compare it to what the determined overall materiality level is. Let's think about that in a bit more detail. Overall materiality determination. 
quantitative benchmark used to establish overall materiality includes. So this is the overall level. This is what happens at the beginning. We're kind of thinking of the full financial statements as a whole. So we need benchmarks to do this. So when you're thinking about what would be a materiality level that we can think for the financial statements as a whole, we're, we're thinking about those large benchmark numbers. And, and you could just imagine, well, what? how would I go about this? How would I go about thinking about what's a, a material misstatement on uh, the full financial statement level? Well, the big numbers you'd be considering then is income before taxes. So we might think about income before taxes or net income uh, before taxes. We might think about the total assets. So when we're talking about tolerable misstatement, types of misstatement we're thinking about misstatements that might be, might be material on the entire financial statement we might be using total assets then as some type of format to calculate what might be uh material and what might be not material notes receivable we might be using we might be using net assets or we might be using total equity and obviously total equity assets minus the liability giving the the total equity so these are the type of big type numbers that we would think of as we would be considering whether or not something would be uh, material, be a material misstatement or not. Now, once we have the quantitative amounts that we're going to be used to determine uh, the overall materiality, they may be lowered by qualitative factors. There might be qualitative factors. In other words, quantitative, qualitative, quantitative, those do no numerical factors, the ones we really want, because they're gonna be a lot easier for us to work with for numerical factors and qualitative, factors that we can't put a number value to as easily but which we might take into consideration so the qualitative factors may include material misstatements in the prior year if there were material misstatements in the prior year that may affect our materiality or overall materiality uh, determination in the current year high risk of fraud if there's a high risk of fraud for whatever reason possibly they're in a typical type of industry or something like that that has a high risk of fraud then that could affect our materiality threshold as well. Potential loan uh, covenant violations. So if there's any loan covenant violations, that could be a problem. Small amounts that could cause the entity to miss uh, forecasted revenues or earnings or affect the trend in earnings. So anything that's good, if there's a small amount, that could be a higher risk and therefore materiality would be affected. The entity uh, is in a, a volatile business environment, has complex operations, or operates in a highly regulated industry. These are also areas where once again, we may say, hey, we, we're gonna adjust the materiality level because of those risk factors. Tolerable misstatement. So now we're moving to tolerable misstatement from overall materiality. Tolerable misstatement, the amount of planning materiality allocated to an account or class of transactions. So now we're talking about not the entity as a whole, but we're talking about the account and class. We're getting down to the more granular type level here. Combining tolerable misstatement is usually greater than planned material for the following reasons. So at the end of the audit process, we're going to look at the tolerable misstatement and we're going to think about the tolerable misstatements and, and compare them to the total misstatement for the total financial statement. So in other words, you might think that if we had the tolerable misstatements, and we were to add up all the tolerable misstatements per account, it should equal the total misstatement. But that's not typically the case. Typically, the tolerable misstatements, as we allocate them to the accounts and classes, if we were to add them all up, would still be less than the total misstatement that we would be looking into for the full uh, financial statement for the full audit for the following reasons. Not all accounts uh, will be misstated by their full tolerable misstatement. So we're going to set a tolerable misstatement for each account and our hope of course is that as we audit these accounts that you know they're they're not going to be at the full tolerable misstatement and therefore when we add up the tolerable misstatements they'll be less than the overall uh, misstatement for the full financial statements the audits of individual accounts are conducted simultaneously materiality is often small a uh, fraction of the account being audited and planning procedures will be enough to identify significant misstatements. So materiality is often a small fraction of the account and we're, we're expecting that our planning procedures will be enough to identify the significant misstatements, of course. When errors are found, we usually have additional testing to that particular account, which should reduce uh, the amount as well. So typically at the end of the audit process, when we think about adding up the tolerable misstatements, they should be less than the overall materiality level. Misstatement and audit findings. As audit evidence is gathered, the auditor 
aggregates misstatements from each account or class of transactions. So we're going to take these misstatements, we're going to aggregate them together as we go through the process. So we're imagining in the timeline, we had uh, the overall misstatement or we had the materiality for the audit as a whole, the financial statements as a whole. Then we thought about each individual account as we go through each individual account and thinking and comparing to the tolerable misstatement, we will aggregate the misstatements from each account and class as we go through the auditing process. We're going to consider the effect of misstatements not adjusted in the prior year. So we're going to look at the prior year, look at the misstatements from the prior year. Uh, we're going to compare the aggregate misstatement to the overall materiality. Then we're going to look at the aggregate, meaning combining together all the misstatements, comparing that to the overall materiality level we determined at the beginning of the process. If the aggregate misstatement is less than overall materiality, the auditor can conclude that the financial statements are fairly presented. So then we're going to add up the misstatements and we're going to basically say, is this less than the, the, the materiality level? If it is, then we can say that the financial statements are presented free of materiality, a material misstatement, obviously including some component of audit risk. And so that's going to be our process. So note again, the goal here, as we put this together is not to say, we're going to eliminate all, all risk, all problems, all errors or, or problems, whether it be due error or fraud. Our goal isn't to do that. It's to set a reasonable level. And then we're actually going to work, of course, that reasonable level into the audit process. We're going to plan for what that level of materiality will be at the beginning. We're going to then break that out by class. And then we're going to add that up and check it out and compare it to what the overall level was at the end of the audit process.